Okay, fantastic. Good morning. My name is Karen A. in Jerusalem, and I am your host for this meeting today, and hopefully uh, intelligent Asian agent spearhead of God's everlasting creation. It is my honor to be with here with you, with two mommies in recovery, well, three, including me, to talk about motherhood, parenting, living the surrendered life, in recovery. I'm here with Kirsty, who's in the UK, and Nadia, who's in South Africa. So we've got a real deal Afro Euro podcast here. And we're thrilled to be with you. And we hope you'll get something out of this as you parent or just live, hopefully in the fourth dimension, in recovery. Our topic today is step three right? Became willing. Became willing to give our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And we're going to talk about that. A word about our seventh tradition. You can go to rico12.com forward slash support support to participate in seventh tradition and make a contribution by PayPal or Venmo. Similarly, if you would like to speak on the Afro Euro podcast, you are welcome to send us a share recorded on the speak pipe there on the website or just reach out to me or to the email on the rico 12 website i'll go ahead and put my number in the chat what else can i tell you this is part of the rico 12 family recovery resources we've got noodle it out with nikki on mondays we've got the big book round table with nikki we've got Justin's Rico 12 podcast with several guests around the world sharing their experience, strength, and hope in recovery for all addictions, all afflictions. And we've got new surprises and new content and projects all the time. We're thrilled to have you here. Without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm not going to introduce our panelists. I'm actually going to ask them to share a little bit about their recovery bio because it's been a while since they introduced themselves. And then um, talk about step three. So, you know, since we're Afro, Euro, Nadia, why don't we start with you? We'll start with Afro. Why don't you introduce ourselves and just say a little bit about step three before we dive deep. Hello, God morning, God afternoon, God evening, wherever you are and whoever's listening, welcome. It's so awesome to have you here. I am Nadia and I am truly, truly a grateful, grateful, recovered alcoholic. I'm a child of God, and I am powerless over <laughs> over anything that I try and manage my life with. I'm just powerless, powerless over alcohol. I'm powerless over thinking, and uh, I'm just so grateful, grateful for this 12-step solution that we've got, and I'm grateful to be here. Third step for me, wow, I have uh, taken – I have taken – a massive, massive third step moment. I took a, a third step moment. I didn't even know it was going to be a third step moment. It just, it actually took me. Hold on, hold on. I didn't take it. It took me. Um, I'll share about it a little bit later. But I had a, I had a total moment of abandonment. I just abandoned myself, my thinking, my little plans and designs. Oh, man. And I, I will never, I hope, God willing that I will never ever forget that moment. It was under a eucalyptus tree by a river. I was sitting on a ant. I didn't even know it was an ant heap, but nonetheless, I was broken. I was in these rooms almost two years, jumping off point. I couldn't live with or without alcohol. I couldn't manage my life. It was that second part of step one, and I was just broken, 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 lost in these rooms. And I prayed that morning. I, I prayed the third step prayer. It was the only prayer that I could remember. It was the only one that I could remember, not even the serenity prayer. And when I opened up my eyes, something had changed. Something had changed inside of me. I've taken my will back a couple of times. Well, I think I have. But I think once you've done it, you just, the minute you try and take things back into your own hands, things start getting very uncomfortable very quickly. <laughs> and then you know there's only one who has all the power 
Thanks. Looking forward to this podcast. It's been Thank you, Nadia. Kirsty, will you introduce yourself, share a little bit about your recovery bio, whatever part you care to share with us this morning that's in your heart and your um, feelings towards step three today, your connection towards step three. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Kirsty, very grateful. Recovered for today, addict, alcoholic. Um. So I say recovered far today because I just have today, if I put my spiritual program into action, if I stay close to God and perform his work well, there's so many ifs in the big book. So I have a home group in AA, a home group in CA, and I'm also was part of setting up an all fellowship meeting. Um, I sponsor ladies, I have a sponsor and I come into the program an absolute broken mess. Not only could I not be a person, I most definitely couldn't be a mother. And it's not like that today. Thank God. Thank God. Like, that's not me. I couldn't fix this. I had to get rid of the idea that I could fix it. And I had to. Absolutely, life depends on it and still does today. Take the God idea. I had to make that decision. That step three decision, like, I hear some people say, like, don't make any big decisions in the first year of recovery. I had to make the biggest decision of my life. I had to decide to turn my will and life over to the care of God, which I didn't understand what that meant. But thank God for beautiful people in AA and CA rooms that could show me what that meant. And to me today, it just means no curse. My mind lies to me about people picking up their drug but about all sorts of crazy things my thinking is broken today I'm shut up cursed there hello God let's bring God into it I have to abandon myself utterly to God my ideas don't work that's like step three in a nutshell know me God 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 like abandon utterly like totally absolutely God what do you want to do with me and no decision, you know, I'm no, God knows best, I do not. Love y'all, you guys, thank you for being here. That's really amazing, you know, I've heard this quote before in the rooms, and ironically enough, there must be a 12-stepper in my little lady's gym here in Jerusalem, but somebody wrote on the, on the whiteboard, humility does not mean thinking less of yourself, it means thinking of yourself less. So, right, thinking of yourself less often, right? So we know we're in a good place. We know we're in recovery. We know we're doing God's will when we're not thinking about our little plans and designs, not about Kirsty, not about Karen, not about Nadia. Not thinking less of myself the way I did when I came up into these rooms, my issues, my ex, my kids, my bad day, my need to lose you know, another five kilo, uh, my bills, my parents, my trauma blah, 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 blah. And we all have impressive resumes of trauma and drama. I won't dazzle you with mine right now, but I could, <laughs> right? And I bet there are some people on this line who could probably outdo me if they wanted to. But we're here to share experience, strength, and hope. So we might talk a little bit about the problem like we do with our sponsees, right? 60 seconds on the problem. Uh, my daughter saw my ex eating ice cream with his kids. He has all the fun and I'm miserable. Done, right? Um, my teenage daughter was late again. We got in a big fight done, right? That's how we do the problem. Then we dive right into the solution. We pivot as they say in business, we pivot right away into the solution, turning our will and our lives to the care of God. As we understood him, Nadia, I know you shared with me that you had a uh, serious insight as to turning your will and your life over to the care of God as we understood it. So let's let's just take it to the court, as they say. Let's hear some real live on the court uh, experience. We're here with you. Share with us. Thanks, Karen. So I'll, I'm going to bring it back to that moment that I just shared on Nana because it was so, so powerful for me. And I have shared it in these in, on this uh, platform before but I was in here I was doing the work okay I had a couple of sponsees but I was doing them when 
So I'm going to lay the land for you. I was I was working with them when it suited me. Okay, me, I, 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 right? So we just stay with me here. I was speaking to my sponsor, but then I wouldn't speak to her the minute she started turning the lens back onto me and, you know, where I wasn't doing the work. So the minute I started getting questioned, then I would cool off on my on my phone calls to her or my check-ins or whatever. Um, it was all according to Nadia's plan of recovery. <laughs> I was doing everything just to suit myself. And I caught myself one morning. I'm going to just give you a quick one line of what it looked like, the insanity. I was standing in my kitchen. It was nine o'clock in the morning and I was alone at home with a cup of coffee. And I was having an argument with someone who wasn't in the house. I had started having it in my head, them answering, then I would answer, then if they say this, this is what I'm going to say. And the next thing I caught myself chucking the phone, the, the cup of coffee at them as if they were in the kitchen. And a real life cup of coffee came crashing down because it smashed against the cupboard and was broken. And I remember standing there just... I came to you and I was like, I blacked out. I came to you and I was like, oh my God, I've just had a real life, full blown argument with myself. Just me in that kitchen. And I felt, I, bro I broke, guys. I broke. I was, I, was, I was on my knees and I was just like, I, I'm, in, I'm insane. I am insane. And there was nothing. I had no, thank God. Thank God, thank God. All I could remember was the third step prayer. In that, in, it was nuts. Those are the, because my sponsor had been teaching me that I, because it's in page 87, that we recite some prayers, right? Because I wasn't yet a member of any religious body. I mean, I was just barely trying to learn how to breathe. But the heavens, I had recited the third step prayer, and that was my prayer on my knees, desperate for help outside of me. Well, I mean, deep down reality, deep down inside every man and woman and child is a great reality. But I begged God. I begged him for help that day. And it came. It really did. It came in droves. Like you said, Kirsty, these beautiful, beautiful brothers and sisters in these rooms. <sighs> Just so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing, Nadia. See, what I'm hearing and what Nadia shared about having an argument with herself, about losing it, about throwing a ceramic mug full of boiling hot coffee, is that this disease means insanity or death. And let's face it, if you're insane, your life isn't much of a life, to put it mildly. So if you are listening to this podcast and you feel like you've gone nuts or you're the living dead or you're trying to put yourself into the place of the dead as many of my sponsees have shared and I'm sure Nadia and Kirsty have met no shortage of people who have either committed tried to commit suicide or had suicidal ideation in these rooms whether they be an OA, SLA, Al-Anon, CA, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. There is hope and there is a solution so long as we remember that we are no longer running the show. And so long as we pick up that step three prayer every day, all day, sometimes multiple times a day, sometimes when we don't want to, and that's usually the most important time, there, there is hope. Kirst, do you want to share on this a little bit? Whether you want to keep going on what Nadi was sharing and give your insight, your big book recovery insight there? Or take it further. Hi, Kirsty. Grateful addict, alcoholic. Um, yeah, do you know what what step three taught me is it's me. I was the problem. Like the root of my troubles was driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion. I was in that self-delusion that only if this was right or this person like I was my only problem 
but I was all I wanted. <laughs> me, me, me. Driven like by fear, but selfishness. It says in the book, above everything on page 62, above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must, or it kills us. But then it goes on to say, God makes that possible. I can't get rid of that selfishness when I realize that I am my problem, driven by fear, selfishness, self-centeredness. Like, yet yeah, knowing that knowledge isn't good enough, I cannot get rid of it. And my step three has little permanent effects unless at once followed by vigorous action. Like, I have to truly give up, abandon myself to God. I know I'm selfish. I know I'm self-centered. Like, I can learn this, I can read the book, the page of the actor and be like, wow, that's me. But that's that's not good enough. I can't get out of that. I don't know whether this is following on from what you shared about, but it's just it's just coming out. So I don't know. God is coming through me, guys. I I had to get out of this selfishness. I related so much to that page of the actor running the show. But how do I get out of it? This book, this beautiful book, and these people tell me, like, God makes that possible, not Kirsty, not not learning or going to meetings or my sponsor when all them things, by the way, are really, really good and necessary for me. But that's not going to get rid of my selfishness. Like what's going to get rid of my selfishness is abandoning myself utterly to God. Like I heard on a meeting last night, like in the, the guy said, bear with me when I would say that. He went, God hasn't removed my obsession to drink and use. And I was like, he went, my relationship with God has. Like, there's a lot of work. It's action, action, action. God's just not going to really, I've got to build a relationship with this person, with this God, with this, you know, spirit of the universe, great reality, you know, whatever that special word is to you. Today, that's my most important relationship in my life, even above the relationship as a parent. Because without that relationship with God, I can't be a parent. I've gone through some difficult times at the minute with my son, as Karen and Nadia both know. And I was in a school meeting and getting told my son's got to move school. And I, me, my selfish, self-centered, false pride, I want my son to go to this school because it's the school I chose, because it's a good school. I, I, I. Like... And I really had to pause and I had to go to God for guidance. And, you know, my gut told me, maybe, maybe this is what God has in plan. Maybe remarkable things will happen if I keep close and perform his work well. How do I keep close and perform his work well when my crazy mind is telling me what, I, what it wants for my son? I have to say, shut up, Kirsty. God, what are we doing? Where are we going? You know, and this was reality. It's that. So I just prayed and prayed. I spoke to another addict and I stayed close to God. I threw myself heavier into this program as I felt the trust like, why is this happening to me? I need to stay plugged into that trust that this is what God wants. This, this is what is happening and have ultimate trust in God. And how I did that is throwing myself into clean house help others clean house trust god help others and do you know today just today how remarkable is this before i about to come on mummy podcast i've got the phone call from school this morning and he can actually stay at the school it's all turned out like it's been such a whirlwind and he's also got a great work placement that we've been trying to get for so long, starting on the 26th of this month. Like remarkable things happened. But my old, a year ago, I would have argued, I would have been selfish. My false pride would have really got me. Whereas I was just honest, reliable, accountable. I'm like, yeah, my son has not acted right. Whatever the school puts in place, how can I be helpful? And I went into it thinking, not what I want. How can I help these teachers that are having to deal with a behaviour that's not acceptable? Like, I went in thinking, how can I be most helpful and useful? And with, you know, let go of my old ideas, open my mind up that I might not know what's best for my son. I might not know which school is best. And God does. So if he gets moved, that is God's will. Because I've put all the right action in. Because I make this decision. But what I have to have is action to stay close to God. Perform his work well. God, 
God, my heart knows. I don't know what God always wants from me, but I pray for his knowledge every day. But what I do know is God did not want me sitting, arguing in a meeting with teachers. I know that's what God doesn't want. So if I stay away from what God doesn't want, what God wants, hopefully praying for the willingness to know, you know, the knowledge to know. That's how I like got through that. And remarkable things have happened. I don't know if I went way off your question, Karen. I feel like I just got. <laughs> this is um, this is really amazing. Now, what you said is all really amazing. Um, we've been deep in this with our sister Kirsty, with her school issues, with the father of her son, with their um differences of opinion, um, with fear, and what you see here. I'm going to take this to the big book for those of us who are listening. First of all, you see a woman in recovery, right? She has an issue. The big book tells us their calamities, trials, and low spots ahead means they're coming. We're not living in utopia, and it's not kingdom come yet. <laughs> okay? So trials and low spots, anyone who has children knows that there are difficulties. I'm not um, telling you something you didn't know. So here there's an issue at school and you could edit or place issue with my teen, issue with my married daughter, issue with my husband. She has an issue. She's armed with the facts. The big book says we always get armed with the facts because many of us, right, instead of reaching for God, we reach for booze, we reach for another man, we reach for internet, we reach for workaholism, we reach for something, we reach for chocolate cake, for drugs. Um. Instead of being in reality and connecting to the fear, the concern, the worry, and then getting into the solution, right? So you see a woman here who's armed with the facts, right? My son might get kicked out of school. That's a bummer. I'm scared. I'm worried. I might have a longer drive to the other school. What if nobody likes him? What if nobody plays with him? What if he doesn't get along with his teacher? What if he doesn't make it at that school, right? And the mind goes on and on and on. Any mother, and certainly a mother who's got a brain of an addict, the mind is going with, you know, hundreds of forms of fear, self-delusion, self-pity, whatever. Okay. But we get armed with the facts. Okay, I have an issue at school. Not happy about it. You don't, the big book doesn't say you have to be chipper about it. We get armed with the facts and into reality and into action, right? This vigorous program of action. So first, I don't ignore it and I don't go smoke pot and tune it out, right? I get all the information. What's going on? What do the teachers say? You know, the information about my kid, you know, whoever you may be, if you've got neurodiverse kids, you know, they're Ritalin, their medication. Are they sleeping well? Are they eating well? Is there something going? You know, we get armed with the facts. And then we just pray to God to help us out. Like she said, she doesn't know what the right school is for her child, but higher power does. So what you see here is a woman who lives her recovery, who helps others. Um, and she's concerned about her son and doing God's will. What this may have looked like in the past. And I, I don't know Kirsty for that long, but as a mother, I can only imagine Oh my gosh, I'm the worst mother. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I'll never make it. Oh my gosh, I, I just can't get this right. Oh my gosh, my son, I'm so worried about him. How will he ever get a job, get married, be a productive member of society, a, a good citizen? You know, this is where mothers go, not just Jewish ones here in Jerusalem. We, we worry a little bit extra. We think uh, we get points and we think we get extra credit points for it. But uh, I'm joking. Right. That's where it goes when it's my will, my world. You know, we spoke about that thinking about me, 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 as opposed to like, mm, I got to help my kids succeed. And, um, you know, we get armed with the facts about it. I can muscle through this, but that hasn't usually, if you're an addict of the hopeless variety, like me, Kirsty or Nadia, you've probably had enough experiences. If you're working this program with the desperation of a drowning woman or man, as the big book says, You've had enough experiences to know that when you've tried that route, it usually ends up pretty bad <laughs> and you just get exhausted, propelled by self-will run riot. So, OK, so we say a little step three prayer. I'm now, you know, willing to 
turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him. God, I don't know what school is good. I don't know what's best for a little guy. Please make me a vessel. How can I be helpful? How can I be of service? And that's what you're hearing here. I just want to point out that um, an unrecovered person, a sponsee, when they come to you with the same issue, they might be freaking out. Um, they might be going on and on. But um, it's a less tiring, more satisfactory way of living. We are not a glum lot. Okay. And I, I just want to say, I relate to that. I had my youngest has hearing aids. And she's probably neurodiverse, as many children with special needs are. And I've also had to meet with the school. And just yesterday, I got a call that they're doing a behavior modification program for her. And I was shocked to hear that, like, the vice principal has to sign off on it. I thought, oh, my, isn't that a bit intense? Isn't her teacher enough? And I just had to let that go. I had to trust that they want what's best for my daughter, even though I don't necessarily always think that or feel that. I just have to let that go and pray that that will be the tool that will help my little one succeed. That we give these things over. I so relate to this. If you have teens, well, maybe we'll give it over to Nadia. Nadia has a teen. You know, we deal with curfews. Um, you know, sketchy behavior, sketchy friends. I'm not saying that about Nadia's teen. She'll share about her own life. But um, we also have to make that decision. And the way it looks like when we're in our disease, which by the way, still happens, even if we do participate in recovery podcasts and work with others, these moments do come up. Nadia, do you want to share about that as a mother with a, with a teen, what that looks like? Thank you. So what I what I would like to share on is I, I told Karen this morning is how I show up as the actor in this deal of being God's child. Okay, so I forget that I'm God's child and I become my daughter's mother, and my entire identity, all my old ideas, just come to the fore. Okay, I'm in charge. I call the shots. I tell her when and how. I have an opinion about her life. I'm God. <laughs> and what usually happens, the show doesn't come off too well, right? Because I'm trying to control her. I'm trying to control her thinking, her friends. And I'm I'm so sneaky about it. And this disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful. You know, I'll drop it here. Like there's one of her friends friends that I'm not too crazy about because I can see this kid from a mile okay it's one of God's kids and I'm judging her that's like a default setting of mine and we'll be talking in the kitchen about her friends and I'll just drop very subtly that you know I picked up that this one's a little bit like jealous like hoping hoping to drop a seed in Nina's mind so that she will eventually just like you know that'll grow and it'll infest her brain and she'll not want to be around this child anymore like, I am really, guys, when it comes to my teenager, I am the actor, page 60 and 61, like Kirstie said, no, no, I'm trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, I'm trying to sort out the chairs and sell the tickets, and I'm up in the stage at the top in the loft trying to arrange the lights, and I'm telling the ballerinas how to dance, and then the actors, and I'm sorting out the cameras, and like Karen said, and I am paced by the end of the day, because there's all these little things that I've got in place to get my daughter and her friends to behave the way I want them to behave. So, but it doesn't just, it doesn't just go into my daughter. I've got two ex-husbands. I've got two fathers because I have two children. I have two marriages, two ex, two uh, previous marriages. So I have two lots of adults that I'm also trying to control because I want them to do things my way. I want them to leave me alone so that I can parent both the kids. Yeah. And show up for the kids the way I want to. Um, and the minute any of them has an opinion, which they rightfully do because they're a parent, uh, I become, what does it say? We become, well, the actor is either quite virtuous, quite considerate, kind, patient, generous, even modest or self-sacrificing, you know? And if I don't get my way, guys, what happens? I become mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. I have been a 
absolute tornado in these men's lives. And you know what? Here's a miracle. Here's a miracle. I've done this work. I am doing this work. And yes, Karen, like you said, there are trials and no spots. Kirsty, we're left at the edge of our seat wondering where our child is going to go, what school, what will happen, will we be liked, will he be liked, will we be accepted, what's our new morning routine going to look like. But when we take a sincere position, we stay close to God and we perform his work while miracles happen. We get to see remarkable things. My home for the next two days has got my first ex-husband, Nina's father, and his wife staying with us. We had a meal last night together. We stayed up late until just before midnight, laughing our heads off and loving on each other. Guys, loving on each other. I got flowers. I got hugs and kisses when they arrived. This morning, we all got together. We had coffee like a family. Huh? And I was the one six years ago dragging them to maintenance court and forcing drug tests to prove that they, you know, they were um, incapable of taking care of my kid, trying to run the show. And then when I said, no, I'm not doing this anymore, God, you do it. You just freaking, you just do it. I get to experience miracles like I did last night. <laughs> That's so awesome. Thank you. What I'm hearing you say, Nadia, is that our behavior will convince them more than our words. We read about this in the big book, right? In the family afterwards, that it's hard, a family that has been dealing with the alcoholic, drug addict, sexaholic, whatever, whatever your drug of choice is, your DOC, is that this takes time. The healing takes time. And all of a sudden, yeah, we're a family. I still relate to that, Nadia. I had a birthday last week and um, I came home. I was actually surprised after a really long day and they were, my 10-year-old had made dinner with my 12-year-old and they had put up balloons and she had bought me lotions and they they decorated and they all made sounds. I was like, wow, <laughs> they, made, they really do nice things once in a while. And, um, and it was just so humble and so simple. It wasn't some grandiose party and it was just really great just being present and feeling the love. And I can tell you, Kirsty's always sharing with us Christmas time that she went with her daughter to get her nails done and went ice skating. And it's like, you see women who are not present, who were in their own heads, who were selfish and resentful. And all of a sudden they're present. They're doing things that normal people do. But that's only because we live our lives knowing that we don't have the dubious luxury of other men, like getting angry, like throwing mugs of boiling hot coffee, like um, for myself personally, I got into a tackle with my best work friend. We had a difference of opinion. I was upset with her and she spoke to my boss and I was very, very, very offended. Like she tattled told on me to my boss and we're good friends. So then I prayed to God. <laughs> Pray to God not to be vindictive, although I did think it was the next right step to talk to her boss as well. But I first prayed that I shouldn't be out to get her and that I should be out to solve a problem. You know, we're always putting that prayer in there. And I did. But you know what happened as an addict? I was really upset and really exhausted and pretty much wasted two full days obsessing about this issue. Um, and again, I thought I was quite virtuous. I thought I shouldn't enable her. That's the Alan on me. I shouldn't be codependent. I thought I was doing recovery things, but it didn't go off right. Maybe there was too much selfishness in there, too much me. You know, sometimes we're confused, you know, like the big book says. Sometimes the actor is quite virtuous and altruistic. And he's still just trying to run the show. At any rate, I had to take two days to pause on this incident and pray. And I just shut up. And it was hard for me because I don't know about you guys as an addict, whether it's at work and I'm talking about a work situation or with a teen or with the school or with the authorities, it's really hard to keep quiet because we addicts have such battered self-esteem. We're so depressive and afraid that if we go quiet for two, three hours, we always have to check. Are we not isolating? Are we not drifting? We must not drift into morbid thoughts and self-pity. 
I saw it was quiet. I was praying, but then I saw I was getting kind of down. I had to quickly call my sponsees, start working with them, quickly get into service. But again, I took that step three commitment to give my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him. And I said, help me be a harbinger of peace. Help me be an example of recovery. Let my actions speak louder than my words and and help me not be hurtful to others, which includes myself. We don't grovel. We stand on our own two feet. We read all about that in the amends. So it's really praying. Don't let me be codependent here. Don't, and, and this is so true for those of you who have nasty routines who yell at you or give you a piece of their mind or a piece of whatever they're giving you. A lot of prayer. And, and what I saw in my step three this past week is just patience. That giving my will and my life over the to the care of God as I understood him meant that I had to be patient. That even I was sitting quiet and praying, I started feeling depressed. I started feeling the blues. And then I had to get an action. I just had to sit it out. Because I knew that I do not have the dubious luxury of other men taking self-will into my hands, going and complaining to human resources, you know. And you know what? Yesterday I spoke to my friend at work. So do we need to talk? I was like, I love you. I just want you to know I love you. Um, I think we better not talk. I'm a little sore and I don't want to say anything I'll regret. And I certainly don't want to hear you say anything about me that you'll regret. So let's just say we'll go out to lunch next week and, and assume we're good. And, and just had to be patient. Just leave it. It's not fully fixed. It's not in control. Just like leave it, put it on God's hands. You know, we focus on the solution and the problem gets solved. And I just felt such a, a victory. Um, in the fourth dimension, just such a victory. So patience, a lot of patience when we're not running the show. Um, Kirsty, do you want to come in on that? Patience, how does patience play in or, or, or comment about anything else relevant to bringing patience, dealing with that discomfort in parenting or in anything else you're going through? Yes, Karen, I love patience. That's one thing I did not have. I didn't have patience because I was irritable, restless and discontent at life. Like, is it possible to have patience when you want to crawl out of your own skin? God gives me patience. You know, I still don't have patience now, you know, but with God with me, with staying close to him and performing his work, well, the step three promises, as we felt the new power drop, flow in we enjoy peace of mind peace of mind gives me patience and when I feel myself being impatient I plug into the power and I practice patience well I practice patience every day with my children God has sent me them children to give me the practice of patience thank you God you know thank you thank you and I seen a question in the chat box Karen are we answering it Perfect. Yeah, I was just going to say we should really get to questions. Uh, You're brilliant. Yeah, you take it. You uh, take it. How do you really let go of worrying about your kids and turn to God without worry? Well, do you know the example I just said that day in the meeting? You know, worry straight away, but I can't. So I pause. I actually come home feeling quite upset. I, but you know, the worry wasn't really there. And I think it's because. Today, I do have ultimate trust in that God because of all the other remarkable things. But I did go into prayer and meditation and I was a wobbly mess. But I did the clear cut directions. I asked God at once to remove it. I told another alcoholic addict, do you know, I didn't sit in my own feelings. I turned to God and I did prayer and meditation and I shared this with someone. I felt like I come out of that meditation with God like hugging me saying it will be okay. And I remember my kid's dad like, why are you okay about this? And I was okay because I trusted that God's plan was the plan. Like, and how I how I got there is building that relationship keeping close to God and performing his work well if I do that remarkable things will happen and knowing that I don't know what's best 
So I know in that sincere position that I sincerely accept reality. Sincere position means to me accept reality. Like how sincere am I? I can't just trust God when things go good. I have to have ultimate trust that this is God's way, whether I think it is or not. Like obviously parents worry and I'm not going to sit here and say that I never worry now about my kids. But what I would say is it's very minimal because I turn to God. I, I make sure I absolutely put the right action in. I stay in them principles in all my affairs. I have conversations with my kids. But ultimately, I trust that even if bad things are happening, like I've had an, I had had another incident with my child who'd come home and had a fight the other night and I was in tears. But again, I turn to God. I put ultimate trust into God. I have no control over my kids' life. Don't And I don't mean I just go, right, you know, get up and do what you want, kids, because that's not the case. I put all the right action in with the help of God, because I don't always know right from wrong, with the help of other alcoholic addicts in this programme, you know, I plug into that power. And it's, I feel as I've gone through my journey and built this relationship, I've got closer and closer to God. And today I do have that ultimate trust. And I've got there, like I said, when I was a bit like, oh my gosh, why is this happening to me? And, you know, that that's worry, isn't it? Taking over fear because I'm driven by fear. I just plug myself in even more. Help others, trust God, clean house. Help others, trust God, clean house. And then I wake up more and more and more. And the relationship blossoms more and more and more. You know, working a thorough steps, 10, 11 and 12, I can't feel any closer to God, you know. So even when things aren't going the way my plans and designs, ultimate trust God has got this I don't know that I hope that answers and helps in some sort of way that is amazing yeah we don't we don't always have to have the answers and just on a lighter side and this is dangerous because I know we, <laughs> we can quickly drift into compulsive overspending but you know it's like if I'm really worried I know that I tend to drift towards, uh, you know, selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking and fear. Um, sometimes I'll just force myself to go out with friends or go shopping or do something, you know, do something different, you know, uncommon sense becomes common sense, you know, just stop doing the things I would normally do. And step six and seven, talk about that, right? We, we pray to get out of our will and, and take a different action. So just but what would I normally do? Okay, what can I do that's different from that? Or what can I do that's the opposite from that? And, you know, okay, I'm worried. Fine. You know, higher power, I'm worried. And now I'm going to go to Pilates. Thank you very much. You know, just a, a, a pro. This is a vigorous program of action, of action. Nadia, do you want to come in on this question? Or I don't see any others yet. Feel free to ask if you have any other questions. Um, guests, Nadia, do you want to come in on this? Yeah. Um... So we've we've spoken before about how we make the big book work for us, right? Because it was written for us. It was written for us if you just suffer from the disease of alcoholism, this book is your textbook for life. For life and all its all its changes. And on page 70, right in the middle, it says the line actually reads like this. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. Now, I've heard both my sisters share on this throughout the meeting because we are in a 12-step program and our 12-step work, our lives depend on that. Our very lives with, of the alcoholic depends on that. That's just how it is with us, okay? So I've lined out the word sex and I've actually got the word teenager, thinking, and worry there, funny enough. And uh, I googled the word worry. It's anxious or troubled. So, again, we're driven by fear. That's our natural state when we're not plugged into the power. We're driven by fear. And I've also shared on this podcast before, Mark Houston says that for him, the analogy of being driven by fear was getting into the limo and fear was the chauffeur. For me, the image that comes to my mind when I'm driven by fear is those huskies, those, those 
dogs that live in the snow, I don't know what part of the world they live in. Anyway, I, that's the image that comes to mind. There's like six of them in a row and they've got a leash all the way between them, like these reins. And there's someone whipping them and driving them and whipping them and driving them. They're just pushing through the snow and pushing and going faster and faster and faster. That's me. It's me driven by fear. So when that stuff plagues me, curse you, we're human beings. We are not perfect. God is the only perfect one. So yes, we do get troubled by fear and worry and anxiety. When that happens, always my go-to but I have to be reminded sometimes. <laughs> I have to be reminded that I'm in a 12 step program and the only solution for certain trials and low spots, Karen started the meeting with that. The only solution to ensure immunity is intensive work with another alcoholic. And that's it. I'm lifted out of self. And you know what else happens? Besides the fact that I'm not spending that hour or that 19 minutes not thinking about me and poor me and all, why is this happening to me and how am I going to fix it and when is it going to come right and what am I, how am I going to get what I need and blah, 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 blah. In, Instead of that craziness, you know what else happens? While I'm taking someone else through the work, God talks through them to me and 99% of the time I get a solution from that work that I'm doing with that person as I've taken a sincere position and I go and I work with another alcoholic addict. We open the book. We have a book between us. And boom, I will get a solution. That's just how it works for us. Yeah, I totally. Wow. First of all, I love that visual driven by 100 forms of fear. Those huskies in the snow and go and whips and go faster, harder. You know, that is I need to remember like to <laughs> when I'm getting crazy, when I'm getting into my, uh, God forbid, I hope it doesn't happen again, but you know, with the trials and low spots ahead, when I get into that attic mode, that spiritual hyperventilation, just to remember those huskies and fear cracking the whip and I say, well, oh, just, just stop, you know, it's just a movie. Just, you know, <laughs> this is just a movie. All you have to do is, you know, turn off the lights, roll up the screen, close the curtains. And just pray, you know, it's like, just, I love that visual. That is so strong. Um, and yes, working with others, this is a 12 step program. If you're only, if you're stuck in step four, don't be, it should be fast. If you're stuck there with your sponsor, switch sponsors. You could stay in touch with your old one and be best friends, but get through it swiftly. Get an idea of your grosser handicaps, learn some truth about yourself and move on. Don't stay in your pity party. You've been living there for who knows, 30, 40, 50 some odd years, you know, let's make a change. 12 step program means you're working a 12 step. You're sponsoring people. You're working with others. You're making coffee at meetings. You're giving out handouts. I don't know what you're doing. Um, but working with others will save the day when all else fails. Um, I'm working with a woman who she was sharing with me, we were go going through step four and I asked her to do a few sample resentments. Like we do them live before she takes 10 to, 10 to paper. And she was looking for her part in a situation with someone who is violent, abusive, and has a criminal record. And I said, well, can you see the dishonesty? See, if you're expecting somebody who's psycho, who's disturbed, who's in pain to act normal and sensible, can you see that that is dishonest? Um, and she did. And then I had a difficulty with someone close to me. And, and she just played that back to me. Like Nadia said, she just said, well, are you expecting somebody who is not healthy and dependable to behave in a healthy and dependable fashion? I said, hey, yeah. <laughs> where'd, you, where'd you get that from? So uh, this is the bright spot of our day, working with others. Kirsty, you want to come in on this or, or take us in a different direction? Yes, I just seen another question in the box. How do you know what God is saying? How God is really directing you? Your ideas versus God's ideas. And do you always ask God about taking action? So as I was reading that, I thought straight of page 86. In thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. 
And here it tells me what to do. Here we ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought or a decision. We relax and take it easy. Meditate, relax, take it easy. We don't struggle. So if I'm struggling, if I'm fighting against something, I know I'm not in God's will. We are often surprised how the right answers come after we have tried this for a while. Practice. I really had to practice talking to God. Like, for me, it was doing the same thing over and over again. You know, if, you, if you're building a relationship with a new partner or a new friend, you're going to meet once a week, you're going to meet, what you, you're going to have that um, continuous commitment. Do you know what I mean? Put the effort in. For me, I talk to God all day, every day. And I don't always know what's God's and what's not mine, but what I do use a really helpful to self-will, God's will test. Is it dishonest? Is it resentful? Is it selfish? Is it fearful? If it's anyone, even the slightest little bit of one of these things, it's me, my will, God's will. Is it honest? Is it pure? Is it unselfish? Is it loving? It has to be all four to be God's will. Absolutely. Like, and that helped me a lot. I had it written down next to my bed for ages where I do my prayers and meditation. Today, as my programs change, I talk to God all day. But what I always know, I don't always know what God's is. I pray God for what God's will is, what God's knowledge is, you know. And I don't always know because we're not perfect, but I'm willing to progress along the spiritual lines. But I always know what's not God's will. I always know when it's me, if it's, you know, any kind of anger, any kind of selfishness, if I'm arguing absolute reality, if it's a struggle. I know that's cursed. Eh? Like, so going with what's not God helps me get to God. Helps me get to God. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing answer. What an amazing answer. And thank you for taking us to the pages of the big book. Um, if you want a cheat sheet, you know, <laughs> in one line, Usually a good a good clue that that you're in his will and not your own is if you're listening rather than talking. <laughs> I was just that's my own personal experience, strength and hope. We're listening, so let's, you know, quiet the voices. Sometimes it's as easy as we need a nap. Sometimes when I meditate, it's because I need to connect. And sometimes I need to just pass out for 10 minutes because I'm tired, because I'm overwhelmed. Um relax, take it easy if that means shopping, if that means ice cream, if that means nature, if that means, you know, insight timer, which I love, if that means exercise, um, just quiet down, listen, and uh, pray for the next intuitive thought, decision, or action. And we're here with you. Just imagine we're all here rooting with you. Imagine the stadium size here. You've got me, Nadia, and Kirsty, but really all of Afro, Euro, all of Rico 12, hundreds of thousands of fellows, recovery Brothers and sisters around the world are rooting for you to live in his well. So I'm going to leave you with that image. We're rooting for you. So is the whole recovery family. You know, go, go, go. You got this. Or as you might want to say, God has got this. Thank you so much. Again, you could visit us on Rico12.com. If you would like to share or want to recommend someone to share, you could reach out to me. I put my number in the chat. And I'm all wishing you a beautiful day where all of us are saying to yourself, thy will, not mine, be done. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you to our beautiful listeners.
one like me survive the storms and walk through wind and rain. Still standing, I will fight the good fight. Still searching for glimmers of light. God. 